factors there. When the Harry Potter phenomenon hit, um, everything changed. The entire game plan changed in several interesting ways. When the first movie came out, Morning Glory and I were invited by a Jewish, Jewish shul in South San Francisco to come and do a presentation on real wizardry and real witchcraft uh, preparatory to the entire class of kids and their parents all going to the premiere of the first Harry Potter movie, to which we were also invited this day. Oh, God bless you. Well, apparently they were looking for somebody to present both of these perspectives, and the word went around, and eventually the referral ended up with Money Boy and I, who were the only witch and wizard couple available. Because there weren't a whole lot of people using the term wizard to describe their work in those days, and I pretty much had a corner in the market at the time. <laughs> well, we went down and we had a wonderful time and we came in our full regalia and we bought a bunch of props and tools and, and, and did a few little interesting tricks to entertain them and stuff like that and talked about the basic stuff, you know, the elements of the circle and the wheel of the year and, and the god and goddess. And um, one of the kids said, well, can you be a wizard if you're Jewish? <laughs> and I said, well, Moses and Solomon are considered to be some of the great wizards of all history, and I believe they were Jewish, is my recollection was. That, that made everybody happy. And, and this kind of precipitated an important part of the dialogue. The wizardry, unlike witchcraft and paganism and many other things, is not a religion. Wizardry is like philosophy or science. It's a, it's a calling, a discipline, but it transcends any particular faith, religion, culture, and that's the most wonderful thing about it. I mean, when you see movies or stories of wizards, they might be all races, any culture, within any religious context. And it's all this, but it's all the same basic concept. You're, you're talking about people who are the wise ones, who are supposed to know stuff that other people don't know, repositories of arcane lore. Well, this is why we use the term for computer wizards, because they know stuff nobody else does. You know? That's kind of come to have that meaning. And in the stories, the job of the wizard is to be the mentor of the, of the young heroes, that is, the teachers of the next generation. And we'll get into an interesting little twisted reason why that may have come about as I go on with the story. But this is basically it. And so we are sitting there in the audience in the balcony. We had the entire balcony for the school, looking down over the sea of pointy hats, because when we came into the theater, well, Morning Glory and I were wearing our regalia, our robes and pointy hats and stuff, because we didn't have time to change. But it was really quite delightful that the entire audience was also robes and pointy hats and stuff. All of it shorter. Um, <laughs> and and, and, all, and um, we looked down over the sea of, of, uh, of kids and, and folks, all eager for the movie and what was going on, and we had this great epiphany. We, we thought, you know, Millions and millions of people, kids especially, are getting turned on to wizardry and witchcraft and stuff by these movies and books, which are enormously popular. Some of them are going to come looking for the real thing. And the Harry Potter mythos has taken a major departure from all the previous stories of this. The Harry Potter stories don't take place in another galaxy far, far away a long time ago. They don't take place in some mythical ancient realm of Middle Earth or somewhere over the rainbow or through the magic uh, wardrobe, they take place right here in this world. And the basic mythos is that somewhere just out of sight, maybe just down some alley or down some country road off in the woods, you know, at some little, you know, hidden places perhaps, but, but still there, magical people might be gathering and doing magical stuff and socializing with each other and look around us, and here we are, you see. <laughs> and I said, well, this is true. This is true. The basic mythos is funny, right too. So it's a fictional story set in a real world, which is quite marvelous. And um, so we figured, you know, we're not that hard to find. Frankly, anybody who's really looking, they can go in any bookstore, they can find your local occult shop, and, and there'll be notices pinned on the bulletin board, covering meeting and such and such, or, or chrysalis moon gathering, you know, such and such a weekend. These things are all over the place. So they're going to find us. And what do we have for them? If they show up, what do we have? We don't have classes available. We don't have training groups available. We don't have anything at all that we can offer, you know, kids from money families who seek us out. 
and not to learn this stuff. And yet there's going to be millions of them doing so. So I got thinking about that, and they, we said, well, what can we do? Well, we make altar statues and altar figurines. So we said, well, let's make some altar figurines for kids, because the first thing you do when you set foot on the magical path is you establish an altar. That's your first step. So we did that. We made a little young god and young goddess, which are very cool, I think. And we decided, OK, that summer was the New Age International Trade Show in Denver. So we were going there with our stuff every year. And so this year was the first year I went along because I had these new pieces and I wanted to go to the show. Previously, other members of our family had been doing this. We had a nice, large, extended family, so we always had several people to do it. And Morning Glory and Wolf um, had been the core of our folks to do that part of the show. But this, this year, we all did. And um, so we had the stuff to show off. And at that time, Tris Telesco, some of you may have read some of her books. Tris Telesco, she's marvelous. She's written over 60 books. She herself doesn't know how many. They're all wonderful. It's an entire library just of her books on all kinds of magical subjects and uh, not just witchcraft, although she's written some good ones about that. She's written ones on superstitions and Lever. the language of flowers and, oh, just a minute. The lever. Pardon? She, she's the one that did the, the really good book on lever. Yes, yes, library. Oh, all kinds. She's wonderful. So she had just written a new book, and she was there with her publisher to sign books and promote the book. And so she comes over, and I'm congratulating her new book, and she says, well, over on when are you going to write your book? Well, I hadn't written any books since I was like, you know, um, in the 60s. And I'm saying, well, you know, I've been busy publishing a magazine, I've been doing sculpture, I've got I haven't had time to read it. She says, I don't want to hear any more excuses, I want you to come meet my publisher. <laughs> <laughs> so she takes me over to the New Age booth, a new page booth, and introduces me to Lori. And gives this glowing introduction, saying, You've got to get this guy to write books for you. So he's really about these books. So I hadn't really thought about that. So Lori says, Well, sit down and tell me, if you were going to write a book for us, what would it be? Up to that moment, I had not given this a moment's thought. But um, I've, I've got this kind of a thing that I operate with. If you ask me a question, this answer comes out. You know, it's sort of like you stick in a quarter and you pull it out. <laughs> <laughs> Comes from doing some interviews over many years and just sort of do it. So, was a man, right? So, so well, how about how about a book that will be sort of like a Boy Scout handbook of wizardry? It'd be everything you want to know, but you know when you first start out, everything that I wished I could have gotten a hold of when I first started out on the path when I was like 11. The book that maybe next time in round in my next incarnation, when I turn 11, I want to be given as my coming of age present or something. You know, I want a book that would be the stuff. You have to have, and it will be useful for your whole life, like my voice got manual when I spoke this song. And I kind of put it in that terms, and she loved it. She said, that's a great idea. You know, write us a proposal. Well, I won't go into all the details, but there were many magical synchronicities that followed that up. And I finally ended up writing a proposal and getting it accepted and committing myself to writing a grimoire for The Apprentice Wizard. Now, I have published a, a magazine, Green Egg, some of you may know, for decades. And in the process of doing that, I've come to know pretty much all the authors and artists in the pagan community over decades and decades. So I know that there's lots of people out there who know a lot more about any given subject than I do. And I know who they are, and I know where they live. <laughs> he is a wizard. <laughs> no, I'm smart enough to know that I don't know anything, but I know who does. <laughs> That's a good point. So I contacted a number of folks um, like this, people that were very the people that are legendary to me, like Ray Buckle and, and uh, well, you know, the, the names are all in here, obviously. And we said, you know, here's this project. Wouldn't it be cool if we all combined our knowledge and wisdom together to create a uh, the handoff, basically? This is this would be the grimoire for the next generation, the next millennium. It would be everything that we wish that we had known and then we'd like to pass on from what we've learned in our lives. Everybody would love this idea. We're about two dozen people. We formed the Great Council, because the Council of Wizards is part of the way the wizard world operates. You have councils and things. And um, the result of that was, was this book. <coughs> and on, um, uh, at, on Bridget's Day, email, Brigantia, home, in bulk, whatever you call it, the holiday with more names than any other holiday, the 1st of February of 2003, I 
made a little presentation at our Bridget Bardic Circle, which is, Bridget is our family's matron goddess, because that's what we do, so we're starting you know, all this stuff. Um, and so in our Bardic Circle on that occasion, I presented the little wizardly soliloquy, which opens the book here. And um, I'm not going to read it, but it's, 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 it starts to look out. And that was my offering. And I put this in a nice little scroll and put it on the altar. And one year later, on, on Brigantia of 2004, I received that great day a box of books from the publisher. It was this. And I put it on the altar precisely one year later. And it's that kind of magical synchronicities that have followed this entire event. All aspects of this have been beset with this. And we have a magical principle that we, that we often do. Um, mention, which is the synchronicity wave. When a certain number of synchronicities pile up, it's like a wave building in the sea. And if you see that coming, you know, there's lots of little synch synchronicities and quinky dates that aren't really significant, just little ripples and waves. But when they start building up and you see this big thing coming at you, you know you're, you're, you're in the group. You know, you see it coming. And the trick is to jump and ride that wave. If you can surf the synchronicity wave, it can take you into all kinds of places. And that's part of the way we do our magic. So there was the synchronicity wave. Well, in the process of working on the book, I figured, OK, I'm going to put down some basic stuff. And then I will just simply refer the readers for more information to some website that has magical classes and stuff. And I knew that there were lots of websites out there teaching magical stuff. I mean, which box had all kinds of listed. So I said, OK, I'll check through these and see which ones would be appropriate. Now, of course, I was looking for anything that, that would offer studies in general magics to youths, you know, from 11 to 18 or so. And I was looking for something that was not uh, promoting any particular religion, but just general magical studies. And there wasn't a single one. It wasn't a single one. Every, uh, there are lots of magical sites and teachings and programs and stuff. All of them are essentially teaching a particular religion, almost all of them witchcraft. And, um, and none of them are letting anybody in under 18. So, well, this became one of those assignments. You, know, you get these phone calls from the goddess, you know, your next assignment, should you choose to accept it, is to do some crazy ass thing that nobody's ever done before. And the secret about, about this phone calls, of course, as you probably figured out, is you don't get to just say, oh, no thanks, I think I'll sit this one out. Yeah. <laughs> and if you do that, your, your show gets canceled. Because, you know, the, the, the audience, that is the gods, they're not going to want you to watch you sitting home, sitting on your on your butt, not doing the thing. They want you out there doing some crazy thing and risking your ass, because it's more interesting than you. <laughs> well, I, get a lot, I get these assignments in my life, and I long ago learned to say, okay, I, you know, I long ago I even stopped saying, why me? I just go, whatever, I just do what the little female voices tell me to do. <laughs> life is so much simpler that way. <laughs> So we decided at that point we had to create our own school. And the idea came then for the Gray School of Wizardry, and we wanted to have the kind of a feel of the magical school like the Hogwarts type of thing, but, but be real, of course. And Hogwarts is not, is not the archetype, really. The archetype is simply the university system, the British university <coughs> system, which goes back to the guild system, which goes back to the old mystery schools, which goes back to... Plato's Academy. I mean, the continuity of this goes through all of history. When education, being able to learn stuff that nobody else knew, is considered the most precious and magical thing you could go for. And, and the privilege of being able to get training from some significant teachers and mentors was so much... I mean, people like Confucius and Plato and Leonardo da Vinci were hired out as mentors and teachers by people who could afford them for their kids. I mean, this is the way it worked. So we wanted to recreate that because we saw in the general school system, kids hated school. And, and you know, somehow the school system has been able to make subjects like history and geography and science seem dull and boring. Now, I think anybody can make those subjects seem dull and boring should probably just be lined up against the wall and shot. <laughs> These are the most fascinating things in the universe. How can they be dull and boring? Kids who don't want to learn songs like We Don't Need No Education becoming the, practically the theme song of an entire generation. Something has gone terribly wrong here. And what has gone wrong, though, 
is the, is the ambitious dream of universal public education. It seems like a really good idea. Everybody should get education. How can we get yeah. that? Yeah. But when something becomes uh, universal and public, it becomes common, and it loses that, that esoteric mystique and allure. And that's what made the Harry Potter phenomenon so new. I mean, J.K. Rowling's was turned down by a dozen publishers before Scholastic, of all the companies, picked it up. Which seems odd. Why Scholastic? Well, they picked it up because it was a story about a school. Okay. I don't even think they appreciated what a huge hit it would be. See, the idea that, that a bunch of kids would learn these stories about going to school? You know, kids hate school. Why would they want to do that? But this isn't just any old school. It's a mystical, magical school. Well, we set out to create them with the real stuff. And we went out to recruit the teachers who really know this stuff, amazing teachers who have written books on it, who know the field. The Gray School served as our advising council, and some of our first generation of teachers were members of the Gray Council. And that's kind of the way it began. I had no idea myself of what was possible in programming and website design. I'd never done anything like it, hardly even looked at any. So not knowing what was impossible, I just figured, well, let's do this and this and this and this. And I talked to some website designers who had done some really good pagan work who said, I'd like to be in on this. And I can do that. I said, yeah, can you do this and this? And how about this over here? Oh, yeah, I can do that. OK. And how about this over here? And I'll, before long, we had developed this impossibly amazing idea of a school that would have seven levels of classes and 16 departments and be able to progress through them with lessons and and hands-on teaching and assignments and, and exams and social activities and houses and, and clubs and school paper and summer camps. All these things evolved into the most amazing phenomenon. And um, that's, the, that's where I'd like to stop my part of this for a moment. And I would like to have, as I uh, introduced earlier, this is Rainbow Stone Talker, our Dean of Faculty, and I would like her to say something about her introduction and experience with the school and, in, and doing the stuff that she's been doing there. I'm putting people on the spot, don't you? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so have at it. Um, <laughs> I'll tell more later. I, it, my journey into the school was very, um, wasn't like a lot of other faculty that come to me. A lot of the faculty that we have now, at one time, were students. And they progressed through and they maybe had a forte in astrology and our cosmology department was lacking in that. So they were students learning things like divination and um, meditation and shielding and grounding and the magical side of things. And then they applied to teach maybe tarot cards or astrology or whatever their forte was in the magical side of their lives. So my own experience with it was I actually came straight in as faculty because I happened to be friends with the person who at that time was the Dean of Studies. And she kept saying, why did you join the grade school? Why did you join the grade school? Why did you join the grade school? So after about a year of this, I said, okay, I'll join the grade school. <laughs> and my very first class I wrote, because I make these little copper ones with a, a, a stone on, crystal stone on the end of them. So the very first class that I wrote was a class on making copper wands which nobody's ever taken yet, but that's beside the point. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it's a level five class. Oh, really? Yeah. And a lot of our students are still level two levels. I think we've got two graduates and one graduating, or mm -hmm. right. two graduates and two graduating. But anyway, I'm in charge of the faculty. So I handle the, uh, not the class content, but the people who teach them. And we have 16 departments, and we have incredibly talented faculty members. Um, in the 16 departments, which are listed in the book, all of the book, all of the book, 16 departments are listed in the book. They're listed in, in this book completely, and they're also in the little brochure. Mm -hmm. The little brochure is a list. There you go, yes, little brochure. And for those of you who are passing around the, uh, the catalog, you can see the full descriptions and listing of classes we had about, as of about two years ago when I printed that up. Right now we have just 350 classes. Actually, 348. Yes. And I think, didn't we just get another one up? We got another one or two uploaded since you've been on your oh, travels. So, we might, so have wrote, we are the 350. We might have wrote 350 by okay. now. So wizard, wizardry teaches just that, which is basic wizardry. That's where you find the history of wizards, uh, artists like Peter Pekalnik that, that do the magical type of, of paintings and drawings and things. 
Nature Studies is exactly that. That's where you learn um, the different things. Uh, I'm doing a class in what Nature Studies at the moment on shamanism, on weather shamanism, and how our mood affects the weather and the weather affects our mood. And the elements and mm -hmm. Gaia theory, all those stuff is in the Magical practice, again, just what it sounds like. That's all your hands on. That's kind of like the crafty. You know, knit a magical garment, sew a magical robe, make a magical wall. Spells, too, in there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and languages. We have Latin and Greek and Egyptian. I don't know. I know we've got French and German. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so this is where you get your languages. And then the psychic arts, and I'm also, I started out as the Dean of Psychic Arts before I took the Dean of Faculty position. <coughs> and psychic arts is again just that, it's your meditation, uh, anything to do with psychic arts, dreaming, mind magics, um, what else is in there? Yeah, the um, clairvoyance, clairaudience, yeah. clairsentience. Then we've got the healing, again just as it says, that's not only just the, the actual healing side of doctors and nurses type healing, but it also covers quite a lot of the alternative therapies. We've got aromatherapy, reflexology, emotional freedom technique, uh, working with chakras, that type of thing all comes into the healing. Wart cunning is taking nature and using it. I always kind of think that wart cunning is kind of a, a marriage between nature studies and magical practice. Because wart cunning is your, why does the, say for example, why does the willow represent the element of water, and how can you use that in a magical ceremony to bring the elements of the willow into your life? Worse is an old word for herbs, and so wart cunning is basically herbal, herbal willow. It's more, you know, arcane term. The magical word. side of herbal, yes, yeah, exactly. herbalism. Exactly. Divination covers things like uh, reading crystals, tarot cards, uh, each thing, anything, the, the pendulums, the, the act of divining is the act of finding knowledge through an oracle, and anything like that is covered in divination. Performance magics is your bardic magics, your music, your arts, your performance. Yes, absolutely. Alchemy and magical sciences, I just uploaded a class on magical dyeing why you would want to make your own dyes, working with your own, and, and how different mordants affect dyeing. When we eventually get the journeyman school going, we're covering things like brewing, and, you know, the, the, the magical aspect of turning a strawberry into strawberry wine. Um, I think in Alchemy we've still got, I think we've got a level one class being written on the perfect chocolate chips of you. <laughs> <laughs> we're also teaching the traditional other aspects of Alchemy, of uh, traditional transformation, and and metallurgy and chemistry and laboratory work and all kinds of things pertaining to that. Because alchemy is, provides a foundation of all of our sciences. The original goals of alchemy of creating artificial life and of uh, extending life and creating all healing panaceas are still the pursuits of modern science. Mm -hmm. Life waves, again, it, it, it's pretty much what it, it says it is. LifeWays looks at things like why we need to recycle, why, you know, being mindful of our carbon footprint, how to get along with people. Um, we teach all our conclave classes. The heads and prefects of the school have classes in LifeWays they need to take, how to be the perfect prefect, uh, how to have leadership skills, that type of thing. Relationships, romance, um, at the journeyman level, and the, the sex magic will fall in this area. So it's all that. This is, each of these is color coded. We should probably mention mm -hmm. that. Each of these is color coded. So life is pink. Life waves is pink. Alchemy is red. Wizardry is indigo. Nature studies silver. Public art is Yeah, I'm only using this slide here. The, the color coding is interesting. Working that out is very interesting. Because people, this is an important part of what we're communicating is that magic isn't just black and white. It comes on the full spectrum of colors. And we've, we've, we've assigned the traditional associations that are found in each of these colors into these departments. And it's been a really neat way of creating the departments based on the colors of magic. Well, to like take light waste, for example, light waste colors is pink. And in, in when I work with the stones doing healing and readings and things, it's always the rose quartz, which is pink, which is the love stone. And it's not necessarily, I love you, do you love me, how much do you love me, will you always love me, that comes from the ego. But it's like the compassion, and it's the, the, the camaraderie, and the celebrating the universal love that each and every one of us has a position 
and the universe would be incomplete without each and every one of those. That is all embodied in a rose quartz, which is pink, and it's all celebrated in the life waste department. Beast Mastery covers everything from horse whispering to how to care for your dog to magical bestiaries. It, it's all kinds of different things in Beast Mastery. Tones and familiars and uh, wildlife rescue and anything like that. And I think, isn't the, 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 the Mitchell Bird, bird Watch? Oh, yeah, that's yeah, right. yeah, part of that. Right. And, uh, as and a competition that the students enter in every spring to count their birds. And the whole, you know, the whole mythical menagerie of beasties and dragons and unicorns and all the rest of the stuff is all part of it. Cosmology covers both astrology and astronomy. Mathematics covers the practical side of maths, as in balancing the checkbook, uh, how to work out if you're getting 50% more, that you're not really getting double what you think you're getting, that it's, you know, it, just to teach you the, the logics of that, as well as things like the numerology and uh, the sacred geometry. And what's the one? I know the number 32, it has a, 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 a name, and you keep seeing the same number over and over and over again. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, there's that. Um, the level of, um, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that would probably fit in there. This is, that's not what you're just going to play. Then we've anyway, yeah. got ceremonial magic, which is exactly what it says. It's anything that you do with ceremony. More, which is your, your, your oral traditions. Uh, I like more. That's where a lot of your magical stories fall under more. Um, because we've got a lot of contemporary fantasy artists and fantasy writers that are producing things in more. And then finally, dark arts. And you know, dark arts is one that always people ask about. It's, oh, dark arts, you teach dark arts. Oh, what do you do? It's good, it's good. You know, and we do talk about werewolves, and we do talk about good fairies and bad fairies, and we do talk about vampires, because they are a part of our culture. Whether you believe them or not, don't need to look at the Twilight series. They're part of our culture. And so, you know, you can jump into dark arts at your level of, of awareness, you know, whether you feel you're being uh, psychically vamped by somebody aware around you and you need to learn how to protect yourself so that you, they don't suck your energy, or whether you just want to learn more about the mythology of the dark energies. I've got a class in there on Cherokee myth, medicine, and magic, which looks at the Cherokee, my ancestors are Cherokee, it looks at the Cherokee side of, of dark energy. And it really is just that. You have to have a dark energy if you're going to have a light energy. This is the yin-yang. You have to have the day in order to have the night. It's got to be a balance. And dark arts doesn't spook you out with werewolves and ghost stories and everything like that. But it looks at hauntings and things like that logically and looks at the energy balance between them and brings it all into perspective so that you don't get spooked out about it. The departments of dark arts encompasses sources of all of the kind of practical magic stuff, the hoodoo, and the um, things that you, that you do on that level. It's called thaumaturgy in traditional thing. We had the difference between that initial black versus white magic was theurgy and thaumaturgy. Mm -hmm. Thaumaturgy is the practical making things happen, and so there's a lot about that in there. And it's, it's usually called sorcery, so, so that's part of it. So that, that encompasses the range of and I look after the teachers, and if any of you are experienced in anything that we've sort of lightly touched on, if you're a practicing astrologer, if you uh, are a working shaman, if you uh, have a passion for maths and sciences, let me know. I'll get a copy and application over. <laughs> now, up to this point, it sounds like we're talking about a school for kids. And that was sort of what we envisioned in the first place, because that's where our focus was. Just as what was our... Um, the focus in writing the grimoire originally. But um, I was very surprised when I started getting reviews of the grimoire from people saying, well, I love the grimoire and I had to buy extra copies for my grandchildren so they wouldn't take mine. Um, <laughs> perhaps appealing to a broader age range than we anticipate. When the school opens its virtual doors, I go to side of 2004, three quarters of the students signing up were adults. Um, some clear into their 70s and covering all ranges in the spans of ages. In fact, I'd say our students um, are, well, they, 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 they range sort of evenly spread, maybe across, you know, you know, 80 years or something like that at a time. 
And that's, that has turned out to be a rather remarkable thing. We had not anticipated. So one of our, part of our social structure we initially created was, um, was four elemental houses for, for youths that, that you would be affiliated with. That would be kind of a smaller grouping within the larger school, much like they do at the Hogwarts thing or any other um, school university where you have your dorms and fraternities. And we called them um, sylph, salamanders, undines, and gnomes. And we gave them the attributions of each of these. And we created a marvelous magical sorting system there where students would come to meet the sorting staff, which is an actual amazing magical physical object that we created, which has a story of its own that I don't have time to go into. But all these things have stories behind them. So there is this staff, like a scepter with a big eyeball in it in the front. And it gives you this whole little poem about the meanings of all the elements and the associations of the elements, and it's beautifully done by Elizabeth Barrett, who is our poet laureate here, the one you mentioned. And uh, it then finally concludes by saying, and now you are a salamander, and it sends you to the house of salamanders. And it does this very well, because the computer is able to determine from your birth date and registration information what your sun sign would be, and your attribute, and your elemental associations, and it very nicely puts people right where they belong. So everybody's been quite pleased with that. But it didn't seem appropriate that we were wanting to mix adults in with the kids in the same place. So we, one of our students, as we were discussing this, came up with this brilliant idea of creating something comparable for adults that would be magical lodges. So we came up with a set of four lodges, the Circle of the Standing Stones, and the, uh, and, right, and the um, Order of the Dancing Flames, and the uh, uh, Society of the Four Winds, and the coterie of the flowing water. So we have waters, winds, flames, and stones are the lodges. And, and the lodges and the houses uh, compete uh, among each other be, between academic credits earned by the students in those respective places and the merits accumulated. For example, students who are attending this gathering here will uh, be able to accumulate merits that can be reported in your house or your lodge will gain merits based on your attendance at this event. And many other kinds of things. There's whole lists of kinds of things that are merit worthy. And we do not do demerits. We do not take away merits from anybody. I just think, oh, well, it's about a little personal campaign against the entire meme of punishment and stuff. I, I, I want to go entirely with positive, rewarding stuff instead of like punishing people. So we don't do that. Anymore. Something else we do uh, that, that, uh, that is kind of under my banner as the dean of faculty is every month we the two different departments will run a competition. I usually run one, as the psychic arts department, I usually run one with divination. And so we'll, we'll run a little, just something that you can do for that month to earn merits for your house. It might be meditate on a tarot card and write a story about it. It might be go for a walk and find an interesting rock and meditate with it and see what story it has to tell for you. It might be work with a tarot deck that you haven't worked with before. It might be invent a method of divination or meditation that we, we're not currently discussing. But we give these little quizzes or little activities, you know, the magical practice might be make a wand. I mean, just, just little things that the students can do. They can get up to four merits for their house. And so we get quite a lot of friendly rivalry. I think at one time the stones and the, the, the flames were like oh, yeah. neck and neck. It was five points here, and then the next day five points there, and then the next day five points here. So it, you, and it really gets the discussion boards on the Grace School very active because people are talking about what they're doing and they're talking about how they're doing it. And people can learn from other people's experience as well as learning from the classes. Because every six months at the equinoxes we award the house hat and the lodge cup to the house and lodge that have earned the most accumulated average total. So you basically take the, the total number of academic merits, that's our academic credits, and the total number of merits, and divide that by the number of students in the respective houses. And this is a running tally. You can see every time you go in. So you know just how you're standing. You say, oh, my house is like a few short here, so maybe if I can you know, finish this class I've been working on, I can get a community. Okay, so it works out really well for being a stimulus, and it's a lot of excitement around the semi-annual awardings. Mm -hmm. And we have the student prefect program, where each house and each lodge has student prefects who are trained in leadership. And this changes every six months, too. So over time, with four houses and four lodges and twice a year changing of this, a lot of people get leadership training to, to really be able to do 
the kind of leadership our community needs. And it helps in mundane life as well as in the magical exactly. community because that leadership skill, you know, for the young ones, it teaches them how to settle things without fires <coughs> on the playground. For the older ones, it teaches them how to settle things without going to the boss and handing in the resignation. The, um, the success of the grimoire, it immediately became New Page's number one top selling book. And it's, it still is. It's, um, it's gotten translated into well, at least half a dozen languages so far, and a number of them are still in the works. I, I haven't see seen that. Right. And right now, that would be hard to do with the illustrations. Right? The most difficult part of that is the illustrations are so integrated into it, you can't really separate them out. I've had, I've had a couple of points in the last few minutes. Uh, I know people have wanted to have it read on tape, mm -hmm. too, but how do you read the right. That's the problem. We, but, you know, it's a good mm -hmm. way to work on it. And so the uh, New Page commissioned a, a sequel. What they're waiting for is the Journeyman Grimoire, but we're not quite ready for that yet because we, we need to get a little bit further ahead in the next phase of our program. Our overall vision is to have three schools come out of this uh, under the overall grade school umbrella. There would be the present um, apprenticeship level, which would correspond in mundane schools to middle school through high school at its general level, although, again, uh, not to imply you have to be a kid to take this. Most of our students are adults. Um, and that would be the Arcane Academy. And then at the next level, which would be college level, a four-year college level program, will be the um, Invisible College. And that will take it. That will be the Journeyman level. And the, uh, when you complete the studies in the current grade school at the apprentice level, you get a certificate of Journeyman Wizard in your major. And it's all nifty and pretty and you get all kinds of cool stuff. And the graduation ceremony. We actually hold a ceremony yeah. online that people attend. Yeah, but we've got several graduates already who have been really eager, and including one of our students uh, graduating right now as a Muslim student who's stuck in there so long that he's actually accumulated he's actually seven years, nine, nine, yeah, nine <laughs> levels worth of studies. He's like way ahead of the whole thing. And uh, just he's, he's wonderful. Just and this would not be possible were the school not non denominational as it is. But by doing that, we're able to, to welcome somebody who can bring into us the entire tradition of Arabic alchemy and all the stuff that comes from that part of the world. And it's, we are so enriched by the different cultures, by the Hindus and the Shintos and the Buddhists and the Jews and the Christians who join the pagans, which are probably the majority, in this endeavor all together and communicating with each other and talking with each other about stuff and comparing their notes and signing off, you know, with their respective things. We have Christian wizards. Yes, yes, we do. And there have been throughout history. It's I have a Christian important. teacher. There you are. And, and, and we love this. magic. Yes. He actually teaches performance magics. Yep. So we, we love this part of it. It's a very important part of the school and part of our philosophy. The school was incorporated as a nonprofit educational institution in the state of California in March of 2004, and we received our, our, our federal 501c3 as an Educational Charitable uh, 501c3 Corporation, um, and I think it was 2006, I think is when we got that. And so we're really well positioned for all that stuff. And um, because, and I was getting back to the books, the, so New Page wanted to commission another book level. Oh, I forgot, the third school will be the Unseen University, and that will take it to the stage where you'll be taking master's studies with an adeptus degree, which would be the equivalent of a PhD which literally means doctor of philosophy, and philosophy means, means love of wisdom, and since wizardry is wisdom, it all brings the whole thing full circle, because the, our, part of our entire point is that, in fact, the whole concept of education and wisdom and philosophy is all part of, of this tradition, the wisdom of the ages that we're trying to bring forth and make available. That's our school motto, in fact. I think that's one reason why we do have so many adult students is because that type of unindoctrined knowledge has not been available to them. Where exactly. I, I know my own personal journey was wherever I went, it was like, well, believe this way in the teaching. Exactly. Believe this way. And I was like, no, I don't think so. Right. So this, this is a place where it doesn't matter what you believe. And, and we're, all, we're all eager to hear it. You know, it's not like, you know, you can't talk about religion here. We're here, eager to hear what people have to say about it and to share it, but it's all in good fellowship and company. Nobody is all picking holy respect. wars with each other. The level of respect is profound. And people who come to the Great Hall maybe with problems or concerns or things that have happened in their family or crises, 
are met with other people who can help them and advise them and bring them forward. The way the whole school operates as a as a family and a community is just amazing. Just amazing. Beautiful. So um, I wasn't quite ready to produce a journeyman grimoire, but I did say that okay, I do have something else I think we need to do. So the second book was a companion. And this is sort of a workbook. Uh, most of all the material here, most of it is taken from classes in the school that are put into a workbook format of things to make and things to do. And in the back of it is pages and pages of things to cut out and assemble, most of which I did because I really enjoy doing that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so you get to make models of the, and working models of all kinds of stuff and nifty things like that. And that was very successful. That became New Pages' number two best-selling book. And so they figured we're on a roll here. So they said, well, what else you got? Well, <laughs> with all these teachers and stuff, um, we soon produced, uh, started producing a series of books uh, from the archives of the Gray School of Wizardry. Uh, one of our teachers, uh, Leopard Dancer, created the Dragon Lore. Leopard Dancer was the assistant faculty and the dean of the And um, Moon Rider, who is our dean of, uh, dean of students. students. And of nature studies. Right, produced gargoyles. And Morning Boy and I uh, did one in the ceremonial magic department called Creating Circles and Ceremonies, which is your basic cookbook of any kind of ritual you could possibly want to imagine. And um, you've got a couple of the pipeline, one of the pipeline yep. solaris. Yeah, one of the pipeline we're working on on uh, Wizards of the World, which would be in the part of wizardry. We had the wizard's bestiary, every kind of magical creature you can possibly imagine, with over 1,500 illustrations. And, uh, uh, yep, that was done with Leopard Dancer. With Leopard Dancer, too. So, so we're, it's, it's a whole enterprise. It's a whole universe going on. We've got the Oracles coming out. A number of other of our teachers have also written books in their departments. And uh, the teaching of these books has become a part of it. We have a program for people who are authors just to teach a class on their book. If they, want to. they can just come and got a book they've written on Druidry or something, we'll teach a class on it, and that the book is the required textbook. We make this available. <coughs> Our most recent innovation in the school is something we call the Magister Program. Because we were having people requesting, uh, saying, well, you know, I've been doing this stuff for all my life. I've got a lot of magical background to study. I don't really think I need to start in at 101 and work my way through up the basic levels, but I'd love to take some classes you've got in your higher level departments. Uh, in various subjects that I'd like to know more about. And we said, okay, well, how about this then? We came up with a program that we call Magisters, and for a set annual fee, people can enroll in this program, and they're not part of the regular um, progressive school of uh, majors and graduation and certificates. They can just have access to take any class in the entire school. And the fee for that is $100 a year. That's it. No other fees, no nothing. Just that. The school fees are annual, um, so the more classes you take within that year, the better the deal for you. But, you know, if you only take one or two classes, we still get the money to support the school. So it, it then well, becomes an incentive. <coughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's the, that's the magister. For normal students, adult students, it's $50 a year, and for you students, it's 25 a year. And after the first year, you can set this up by a subscription. It will just simply be... You know, five dollars will come out of your designated account if you're in the adult uh, subscription program every month, and you don't have to worry about it. And that's it. No special extra uh, fees for credits or for classes or anything else. We're trying to make it easy. We did not set this up to make money. We set it up to make a difference. And we can we, we can use the money. And we have many people donate, being donors, who have said this is so good. I want to support it, and are making donations from $10 to $100 a month people are doing, and that helps to support it, because we do pay our <coughs> teachers very inadequate stipends, but at least something to make it, uh, you know, to give them a little bit of a reward for this. And thing. they do get to take all the classes from the other teachers. Yes, they have, uh, stu teachers have full access to the, to the program, which is a pretty good deal too. We keep modifying it, evolving and developing it to meet the needs of, of the students and of the teachers to try to make it what we want to have, because we get to make this up. We're not dependent on somebody else's rules or anything else. This is our school, and we can make it work for all of us. And it's been just 
I'm sure we'll do that. And I think that's the important thing. It doesn't matter whether you're eight or ninety-eight. You find some eight. All right. It doesn't matter whether you're thirteen or one hundred and thirty. Right. See, I, I, I don't deal with the student side of things. That's right. But it, it really doesn't matter because the classes are there. That the knowledge is the same, regardless of your age. It's your level of awareness. And that, that's what I think is the most important. And these are classes being taught. This is not a correspondence course. This is not just you know automated stuff. It's it's you've got teachers who are there for you, who are giving you these lessons and assignments, who are who are reviewing your assignments and discussing them with you and grading them and it's it's as interactive as if you were in a classroom. It's one on one. It's one on one with your teachers. And we have thirty teachers presently who are really amazing and we are always looking for new ones. There's a couple of people here that have already approached saying, hey, you know, we'd love to have you on the faculty if you'd like to uh, join us. And if you uh, and if you do, and you are, this is the person to see. She is our dean <laughs> faculty, and she has the applications and the process to do this. My, well, goal, say about that. my goal is to get a dean and an assistant dean in every department. Now, at the moment, I've got several faculty members that don't want to be a dean or an assistant dean, and that's fine. I've got some that would like to, but haven't had the experience in teaching yet, and that's fine too. But with 30 faculty members and 32 seats to fill, 34 if you count, 30, no, 36 if you count the dean of studies, dean of students, dean of faculty, and their assistants. So, and I, you can see that a lot of us are doubling up. Um, I'm actually the dean of faculty and the dean of two departments and the standing in dean of a department and the standing in assistant dean of two departments at the moment. And my situation is not unique. Uh, the dean of studies is the, the dean of students is the same. She's the dean of students, she's the dean of a department, she's the assistant dean of the department, she's babysitting two departments. You know, because we just don't have enough butts on chairs at the moment. We're only six years into this, folks. <laughs> but it's amazing what we've come in six years. Oh, yes. And we're really, we're really and the excited caliber about of teaching, the caliber of the writing. Phenomenal. Well, the classes are developed. Um, there's a program for that. There's a training program for teachers to come in called Fabulous Faculty. So you're not just sort of thrown into the deep end of the pool. We will help you develop your classes. If somebody here, for example, is teaching a workshop, this could potentially be developed into a class. Mm -hmm. You know, with assignments and exams and, and reviews and all the rest of the stuff that comes with it. And we hold your hand right through you starting the application process to uploading your first class. Teachers are expected to upload two classes from their, to write and upload two classes within the first six months. Uh, considering that once you're experienced at it, you can do two classes a week, it's really not asking that much. To stay a teacher, you need to do one class a year from then on. The, um, let's see, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, the process is if you're a teacher in the department, then and you report to your dean of your department. And then the department deans report to the dean of studies, who's overall all the, all the academic stuff. Well, that goes all the way. Or, or you. Depending on the nature of the inquiry. And, and so then, then, of course, I'm the headmaster, so everything um, that can't be taken care of at lower levels percolates up to me if it comes to that. And if I need some backup, then the, uh, above me is the uh, is the board of directors, and then we have the great council, the advisory council. So this whole thing is like an hourglass in some sense. There's the, there's the whole school thing and all the stuff involved we're talking about, and then there's me in the middle there, and there's the board of directors and the great council, and the entire pagan community out there, basically a magical community, I should say, who are who we tap for resources. So. And, it, and it really isn't something that we just throw together in the sense that. We have legal advisories, and, you know, we've got a, a contract drawn up, we've got uh, legal agreements drawn up, disclaimers, the whole, the whole nine yards, you know, it's professional, it's everything I've ever seen. So that's basically it. So now it's time for questions and stuff. So you have to sign into one major? Can you pick multiple majors? You can actually pick a multiple major, because what we do, we have, you can choose your department for major, but let's say you're like, oh, well, I don't know whether I want to do divination or this, 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 and this. We have something called a rainbow major. And that means it, it, it's, quite, it, it's quite an achievement. You have where the main focus is, is your major. And then you go forward and you take classes in all the other departments. 
Um, I don't have all the particular requirements for it. That would be the deep studies of animals that. But we also have the rainbow major for the students and for the faculty. And for faculty to get a rainbow major, you need to write one original class in every department. You can also be an aura wizard as a faculty, which is to write one class in every seven levels of a particular department. But all the information for the majors and the minors is actually, I believe it's on the website. And uh, you can, uh, the, you don't choose your major in the first year anyway. You get, you your first year is your introductory foundation year. We expect people to choose the major sometime during the second level, not in the level, before you go into the third level. So that gives a little time to familiarize yourself with the school and your interests to proceed. And at that point, you also ask a request a member of faculty to give you faculty advice. Right, you get faculty advisors and stuff like that. So that you're, you have general ed requirements, which are pretty much the first two years. Yes. Yeah, and there are things like, um, well, we have a class called Techno Magic which is how to use your computer safely. <laughs> you know, don't give out your social security number. You know, you know just, just basic stuff. Um, we also have ethics, which is, a, which is a required class, so that you learn how to treat people. Um, I can't think of too long. It was basic ground and shielding. Is there a in there? I know there is. A, there are several classes for that. But I think they're covered in, in the computer. Each, each, um, uh, each level has a couple of required classes at that level that everybody needs to take. They're right? you know, just basic stuff you need to know. Right? And then you're, you're on your own. Uh, people, can, students can take up to four classes simultaneously. And um, I don't know if there's a limit for masters. I, I think the masters are useful as well. Level one has three pre-breakfast classes. Level two has two prerequisites. So you take, you enroll in your three required classes, and then you can choose an elective. Now, you don't have to finish your three required classes to take another elective. You can stay enrolled in those classes, finish your elective, and choose another elective. But before you level up from level one to level two, you have to finish those required classes. And then level two has required classes that have to be finished before you go to level three. Seven. Seven. So, um, have your graduates or your degrees been recognized by um, other groups? Um, well, not by any means that we are aware of, particularly, but uh, we expect as time goes on that because of the quality of the education we're providing, the quality of the people that are coming out, that I think the recognition that, that somebody got their training at the very school will be regarded as the same way people might say, oh, somebody graduated from Harvard or Yale. I think it also stands, it, it, it adds a lot of, of weight to their own tradition to be able to say, I graduated from the Gray School of Wizardry. So, you know, if you happen to be in, in your own circle, they will understand more than, say, your boss or your neighbor, what you've actually achieved. In fact, one of the things I found very interesting was that fairly early on, as I started going out into the community after this book had been published, and uh, was to have people coming up who were the leaders of various traditions of all kinds throughout the whole community saying they were using this as a basic training manual for their entire tradition, which is very gratifying because the material here is basic and general and yet concrete enough and well and you know, authentic enough to be useful for that way. So um, everybody can use this stuff. This is not something that requires you to be part of any particular group or tradition to find it useful. It's general wizardry studies of all sorts, the wisdom of the ages and everything you want to know. If you want to get some sense of the way that goes. Really, just taking a look through this will give you a certain feel of what we're talking about here and the quality of the copies. And copies are available, right? Yes, <laughs> at our booth, just around the corner. Yes, we have. And we have, um, no, it's in here. It's 2.30 when we start. So how much time do we get? Do we get to uh, I mean, I mean, to four or to four? Well, anyway, our first hour is just about up. And I'm going to put a little more for questions and answers if anything else you want to know. I did want to say some things about the Witch School, though, is that we have some very dear and old friends, you know, Don and Ed, who've been running the Witch School, and we've got, uh, we got into this a little bit ahead of us with magical study and online stuff and, and really wonderful systems and ideas. And their primary focus has been teaching the witchcraft, specifically the Corellian tradition, but have added a lot of other material to mm. this as well. 
And we've, we have an exchange program between the two schools uh, for, for comparable credits. And we have little friendly um, competitions at times. We've done tournaments, you know, inter, inter, intermural tri-wizard tournaments that have been a lot of fun. And so we look forward to doing more things together as time goes on. It's always nice to have somebody else at the other end to kind of play off of and, and back and forth, but it helps if we're actually friends behind it. A, a theme which is actually reflected in various places in the Hogwarts series as well. You know, and I, we rather enjoy that little thing. So we certainly invite and welcome any of our students to take classes with Wood School and to enroll in that because they do offer a lot of specialized material that, that provides more religious programming that we don't offer and vice versa. So it works well to have both of us out there doing these things.